What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of, you know? And Steve, I love talking about the challenge story. So I had Moise Navon on, who is uh, the founding engineer at Mobileye. Mobileye, they, their journey was, they were acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion, okay? They are fueling the autonomous vehicle a revolution. What struck me though was not that. What struck me was there was points in the journey and you could relate to this and we're gonna talk about, you know, I have Steve Adams and we're gonna talk about his journey, but what struck to me was that when we said throughout he had to take pay cuts, he had to work really long hours and we only see the end of the journey, we don't see the journey and he had to go back at one point to his kids and his wife and go, I, I'm cutting my salary we are pulling out of all extracurricular activities. We can't have any niceties. We can't go out to eat. We can't order in nothing. And that's like the reality of the journey. And, and I love hearing those stories because that's the reality for any business owner pretty much. But we only see the success after 20 years. So I love putting a spotlight on those things. So check out that. The founder of P90X talks about like some crazy things with him making money as a street mine before he, you know, took off and many, many more on Spartan Insider. So check out those episodes. This, you know, this show is brought to you by and funded by my company, Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is we help B2B businesses connect their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And we help them by running their podcast. And the podcast, Steve, I tell people, it has to generate ROI because that makes it sustainable. And then you keep doing it. Even if it's a passion for someone, if it's not generating ROI, you stop doing it. So we want to make sure, yes, it produces amazing content, but it needs to generate a return and serve the business itself. Um, I think there's a bigger purpose for what we do. Um, I do consider this podcasting leaving a legacy for my guests and for myself. And short story, um, people can go to the about page to watch the full interview. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. And his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him. So you can actually watch that full hour interview on my about page. And that's really what fuels my, my motivation and inspiration. Um, and I will never stop podcasting or producing content just for that fact alone um, of leaving, leaving a legacy. So if you have questions about podcasting, we've been doing it for over 10 years. Um, go to rise25.com, support at rise25media.com. Um, I am excited to introduce today's guest, and I want a big, big shout out to Eric Douay. Eric Douay runs Fair Merchant Solutions. For decades, he's been helping the hotel, travel, and grocery industry and other industries with payment processing, and specifically higher risk transactions. So check out, you know, fairmerchantsolutions.com. And before we started talking, Steve and I hit record. We were like, who, are, who's an amazing pe person in our universe? And Kevin Thompson came up and. Uh, Kevin Thompson runs Tribe for Leaders. So shout out to you, Kevin. I actually talked to you later today. Um, Steve. Steve Adams is CEO at Tiger Neuroscience, which helps decode and optimize human performance. What it is, it's a science-based approach to improving performance. Their formula is this. It's maybe probably, I guess, Steve's safe to say it's simple but not easy. So performance equals skill minus interference. So they want to eliminate interference. He's going to talk more about that. Um, Steve went from being the largest franchisee of a national pet supply chain to Tiger Neuroscience, which their mission is to contribute to the well-being and performance transformation of people. And they specifically help professionals, entrepreneurs, and biohackers. Steve, thank you for joining me. I totally appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, yeah. Happy to be on the show with you. So, you know, I want to break down maybe that formula first. And I, I do, you know, you've talked to and worked with Penn State coach, um, co top copywriters, business leaders. Talk about the formula first. Performance equals skill minus interference. 
Well, I'll tell you a real quick story about how I came to that. Um, I was um, presenting our program to uh, uh, Michigan State University as well. And um, our, the chief medical officer there, he's a pediatric neurosurgeon. So he's not a, a, he's, he's a smart guy, obviously. And he, uh, he said, you know, he goes, I have this formula on my computer screen. I'm going to turn around and show it to you. He goes, this is exactly what you guys do. And it, mm. no kidding. It was on there. It was, that was his. Really? It, Performance it, equals skill minus interference. Yeah. And I said, can I use it? He says, absolutely. He says, because he, he said it, it communicates clearly what you do. Oh, wow. And so, so the, the essence of the formula is this. Um, we all Why have, did he have that formula? Why, what, what about what he does? Why did he have that formula on his computer screen? Um, um, Dr. Valino uh, works with all of the athletic programs at Michigan State as well. Mm. And um, he, has, he has a broader vision for uh, an enhancement to their training facilities. Mm. And part of it was and is, is to create a neuroscience aspect to it. And so he had that in there for the board and trustees at the university. He was trying to boil down all the work he's doing into a very yeah. simple formula. I gotcha. Exactly. Yeah. So and what so, do you mean by, yeah, so going to. So, so the big idea is we all have skills and, and this, this formula really works when you're in your domain of expertise. Um, and so we all have skills, but the problem is we also have a lot of interference. And so interference can be things like uh, emotional control, or it can be, I don't, I don't have sustained energy every day. Um, I have an inability to focus. Um, it could be all the way to a clinical condition like anxiety or depression or ADHD or trauma, PTSD, something like that. Essentially what it is, is anything that gets in the way of you feeling your best and performing your best is interference. And so mm. what our brand promise is, is that if you go through the steps of our process, um, we're going to eliminate or reduce that interference. And now your skill is going to predominate and that's going to elevate your performance. We will go detail on this and we won't go there yet, but if you can relate to this, anyone out there can relate to this. Steve was a burned out entrepreneur who hit a wall. Okay. He has lived this That's for a long time. And this is the same thing he used for himself. And he wanted to bring this to other people so they didn't have to experience that hopefully. Um, or if they have take them across that chasm, but can you talk a little bit, Steve, about some of those, inter what are the most common interferences? So people, because first is probably recognizing there's interference. When you were pushing through everything and burning out, you didn't even recognize all these interferences. Yeah. Well, the most common one that you see with people who are achievement oriented, goal oriented is they simply do not know how to manage stress. And we have something called an autonomic nervous system, which is like the peripheral branch of your central nervous system and that's the that's the system that's keeping us into something called homeostasis which means balance and so it's monitoring your environment and the problem we have as humans is that unlike animals you know there's a really great a catchy title to a book that says um, why zebras don't get ulcers oh yeah by robert sapolsky at stanford and animals are one-to-one -one with their environment you know they the lion chases them, they go into flight or fright, or, <laughs> you know, and they go do their thing and then they get away and then they can lay down and rest like a dog. You know, a dog gets worked up when the doorbell rings and then he shakes and then he's good. Well, humans aren't like that. We, we have this uh, ability that is unique to us and that is consciousness. And so we, we can think about something in the future or we can ruminate about something that we did did or did not do in the past and we can create the same bodily response mm. as if the bus was about to run over us and so uh that's the one of the most common and our first program really gets to the core of that through something called heart rate variability training where we um are able to teach someone how to first of all um experience balance maybe they haven't experienced it in a long time and that now they know what it feels like to be in balance and so when they are stressed they notice it and then they can self-regulate back out of it and um jeremy it has amazing long-term health impact because mm. people that um have chronic what's called sympathetic tone meaning they're always in flight or fright 
that's, that's correlated with something called poor HRV, heart rate variability. And that leads to nine of the 10 leading causes of death in North America. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I was reading, anyone, I suggest go to tigerneuro.com and then they have a process, our process. And I was reading through that, Steve, and the first step, you call it a baby step, would be, for me, that would be not a, not a baby step. I don't know. I'll tell you why, but you have the HRV and the sleep optimization. I, that's the number one thing I am horrendous at. I am amazing at um, diet and other th- aspects of health. I am absolutely terrible with sleep hygiene, okay? And by the way, the HRV, I have, just to, to piggyback on that, um, I have done a program where, um, I don't know if it's similar, but I was actually um, strapped into a computer and was trying to mon- you know, keep my heart rate at a certain um, pace. Like it was like a program that was, was actually monitoring if, I, if I'm good at it or not. Um, so I'm really curious on the heart rate variability. Um, but uh, the sleep part for me would not be a baby step. I've been like, I don't know how. So I guess managing stress is where I wanted to go. How do you manage stress? Or how do you get pe- someone like me to change their habits around sleep? Um, it's not an insignificant amount of work. Um, yeah. With sleep, it's mainly an attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, our North American culture is, uh, especially in the U.S., is very uh, much oriented around uh, that's the first thing that gets compromised when they're busy. And actually, it's actually your number one to do every day is to make sure you get good sleep because um, an hour invested in sleep uh, is going to get you more than trying to extend your productivity an extra hour. Um, you know, and I won't, we won't go into all of it now. I'm writing a book right now. Yeah. Uh, it's going to have a lot of this research, but um, there's some very bad things that happen to you physiologically, cognitively. Terrible things. Yes. Like terrible things. Right. And I know that and I still do it. Right. It's about education. Yeah. And so we educate people on what's happening inside in their body when they sleep well and when they don't. And that usually convinces them and motivates them to change. What's the best story that you could tell me to convince me to do it? I need to hear like a terrible story. Well, I, I'm sure there are other people like me who are yeah. just sacrifice sleep sometimes. And so yep. I don't know if there's a story that sticks out, like just a scary story of someone who just did not get sleep for a prolonged period of time. Well, yeah, I've got a real scary one. I have a friend that um, uh, I won't name um, who um, I've known for 25 years in this. um, I'm just going to keep it gender neutral and everything. So we protect their identity. But this person uh, would fall asleep, you know, uh, maybe for 30 minutes at 730 in the evening, um, uh, you know, watching a TV show, go to bed at 10, wake up at 2 a.m. and not be able to go back to sleep. And he did that 25 years. And he never, I guess I blew it. I said it was a he, but he, um, he never um, addressed it, never sought help for it. And now he is um, 70, he's in his 70s and he is in a um, full, he's, he's in a full dementia care with mm. Alzheimer's. Wow. Uh, so poor sleep is highly correlated with onset of Alzheimer's and dementias because when you don't get the, the right sleep, the right quality of sleep within the sleep cycles, um, there's, a, there's a cellular um, and neural cleaning process that happens at night that doesn't mm. take place. And so you're just, you're just, you're, you're playing. How much with, sleep should we get? National Sleep Foundation says eight hours of sleep opportunity um, so that you can get roughly with a 80 to 85 percent sleep efficiency you can get about six to six and a half hours of actual you're out you're sleeping okay that's the goal and so what we do we start simple with people we we outfit them with an aura ring um mm-hmm. and that way their coach is seeing not only their sleep total their sleep. maybe i need to buy one today yeah and, i'm serious and, yeah and, and we can help you with that because we have a team coaching <laughs> dashboard and and uh we we teach you how to self-regulate off your own data Mm. That's really cool. And that's what you recommend, Aura Ring. I do because uh, it, it gives you really three slices of data. You get heart rate variability, you get morning readiness, and you get sleep data. And 
we teach our clients how to modulate their output both in exercise and then work based on their readiness scores. Mm, that's really cool. Um, so what else about managing stress? How, how can people better manage stress? Well, I, you know, it's really two things. It's, um, I think it's three things. One is, you know, you got to optimize your, your health, your physiology so that you're more resilient to handle it. Mm. Um, you have to optimize your sleep because we all know if we get a bad night's sleep, the next day, an issue is 10 times bigger than if we're rested. Okay. You, you, I'm sure you've experienced it too. And then yeah. really mastering heart rate variability is learning. We teach people how to do breathing exercises to mm. get in a state of coherence. And um, just a personal example, uh, my, my HRV score is probably 40 or 50% higher than it was just three years ago. And um, the, uh, that correlates to longevity. I've had Wim Hof on the podcast. I don't know if you've looked at Wim Hof stuff, but he's like the, they call him the Iceman. Yeah. And he um, does some, I mean, he really specializes in like cold exposure therapy, but he does some breathing techniques too. And it's amazing the effects of just not even long-term, but short-term effects that you realize right away from doing those things. Right away, yeah. I think one of the things that we, what I've tried to do is say, okay, um, I've spent the last 25 years trying to be a peak performer and people like us are super busy and there, there literally are dozens of experts in every domain that we try to work with at Tiger Neuroscience. What we've done is we've reduced it down, simplified it and came up with a way for people who are busy to implement new habits in a simple, easy way. Yeah. I mean, you have professionals, entrepreneurs, biohackers, um, talk about, you did some work with Penn State coach. Yeah, it was a fun story. Um, Patrick Chambers is a great guy. He has been a Division One basketball coach for many years. He was at Villanova for many years. And then the last uh, uh, nine seasons at Penn State. And I met him out of a, a story. And I'm sorry if you hear a mower. Somebody, oh, you're fine. My lawn service showed up. Um, it always happens when you're right in the middle of an interview. Yeah. There's going to be someone like blowing leaves outside. So it's not too bad. Yeah. So um, uh, Coach Chambers had a tough uh, thing happen on national TV the year prior where um, he kind of lost control with one of his players. And I met him the following summer and he just said, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm struggling with this. Um, I, I don't have the, the control that I want. And then it leads to me not teaching my players. I end up yelling at them. And so in effect, he was interference for his players. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. So we started working with him um, in August of last year and, um, and we really focused on heart rate variability and, and um, as he got into the season, um, the, uh, he noticed that there was a bigger space between what he saw on the court and how he reacted. And, um, and you know, I just interviewed him today, uh, yesterday for my mm. book. And, and what he said, the biggest thing was, is it gave me emotional control. It gave me a sense of calm and inner strength and resilience. And so as the game is unfolding, I was able to walk into the huddle during games and be very calm. Mm teach effectively and my players fed off that and so they knew they didn't need to look over their shoulders anymore they could just play and you know I'm not going to sit here and claim we're the reason for this only but they went from a losing record last year to they they, they had their the winningest season in a decade this year with the same players as last year and they would have made the NCAA tournament but it got canceled what I hate about this story is I went to Madison and so, um, as a Badger fan, I don't like that you're improving the Penn State program, but that's totally cool. Um, <laughs> well, I'm a Spartan fan, so. Okay, there you go. Um, but yeah, it makes me think of like, you know, being in Chicago, Phil Jackson, you always see he's kind of like Zen, you know, people call him like the Zen master, and that's kind of the, what he embodied. Right. And, yeah. and that's all it was for Coach Chambers. He is a brilliant basketball coach. He understands the game. But this one aspect of his life was getting in the way and creating interference with his players. And so we were able to resolve that. Hmm. That's really cool. Um, the, and then there was um, 
top copywriters you work with. Um, and talk about that for a second. Yeah, we've got a, a guy named Kevin Donlin. Um, he, um, you know, he's a very effective copywriter. He has been doing it for over 15, 20 years. And um, he went on our program about, I don't know, about four or five months ago. And what he said to me was, you know, uh, you know, we all want to get in the zone, all right? That time when we're at our best, feel our best, and we're doing deep work like the author Cal Newport um, wrote about in a book with the same title. And he said, my ability to get into flow state and to do deep work and write my best work has expanded like threefold since I went on the program. Wow. Because a, a part of what we do is also called neurofeedback, which is a brain training program um, where we optimize the electrical firing in the brain. And the thing that makes us unique in that regard is there's a lot of people doing neurofeedback. Not many people integrate heart rate variability and sleep. We look at it as three legs to a stool, which is the first kind of foundational aspect of a person's physiology that we go to work on before we advance them into our other programs. Yeah, it seems like that's kind of step one, which yep. is synchronized and you're doing kind of brain training and autonomic you know, nervous system training, right? So synchronize is really step one that the the, the baby step is just for folks who maybe yeah. aren't ready to step all the way in. Yeah. We give them a, you know, but the, the synchronized program on our website is really all of that. It's sleep, it's HRV, and it's neurofeedback yeah. training. Because really what you do, and I was, when I was researching it, is you take something average performance or even below performance that's low value to getting someone in the zone to elite performance, that's really, correct. right? And so that's kind of the end goal. And then some of these steps in between, um, I was like, what's that? That for me, that's not a baby step. Like it should be like, like it should be not baby step, but the most important step or something, yeah. you know, that's yeah. like, this is like baseline. Like you need to have this before you have everything else. Um, step one is synchronized. Step two, talk about step two for a second is yeah. optimized. I about this. I have a doctor from Los Angeles who worked in Silicon Valley with overstressed burned out um, techie guys for, for many years. Um, Dr. Matt McNamee, um, he's a naturopathic MD and he has a specialty in neuroendocrinology. So he understands the brain, the chemical side of the brain besides the electrical that we work on. And so after you've done this foundational work of optimizing your brain and your autonomic nervous system and your sleep, um, we offer the second program called Optimize, and this is a functional medicine program. And so what hmm. Dr. Matt does is he does an in-depth, very precision health screen that is um, a lot more advanced than what you're going to get at a general practitioner's office. And so we go into things like your genetics, um, your telomeres, we're measuring your gut biome, um, a high-level neurotransmitter and hormone test. Mm -hmm. And what he's doing is he's forming a mosaic of information that tells him where you are between health and disease, looking at inflammation, oxidative stress, and cellular age to assess where you are in those biomarkers. That's pretty cool. On that spectrum. And then through research, we've, we've built seven habits that if you implement them over time with your, and all of this stuff is delivered into the home through Zoom with a performance concierge who works with you to coach you. Um, we take several months to help build those habits into your life. And so now what we've done is we've, we've balanced your autonomic nervous system and your brain. And now we've optimized your body, your physical health. And now that's puts you in a position where you really are, uh, have the whole package to be able to get into flow states, to be in, in zone much more than someone mm -hmm. who is, you know, struggling with weight or with um, energy or any number of other problems. Talk about the seven habits for a second. By the way, like I know on the podcast, I've had some of the, some of the top health and longevity experts and they just one piece of that is, is really valuable. Just the telomere piece, like people will say, well, I think it's, if you shorten your telomeres, they say that's technically reversing aging. Right. I don't know if I'm getting that right. But so they are on the doing research on how do you shorten someone's telomeres, but one where your telomere is at, right? If people yeah, know where you are baseline. Yeah. know where you are, but th those other things people, you know, 
are super important as far as the, the biome and all like looking holistically at it. But that one piece is fascinating alone. So that's pretty cool that you have all of those pieces in, in the optimized portion. We um, do. We what, do. what were some of the sub and habits? Well, the habits are uh, um, HRV breath work. That's the mm -hmm. first one. Yep. Okay. You're kind of already getting that because you did it in the first program. Second one is my, a mindfulness practice. So meditation. And we're, we're not prescriptive on how people do that because everybody's different. There's a million right. ways to do it. We just say, you got to take 20 minutes a day and you got to pattern interrupt. Okay. Um, and there's been over 1400 studies on the benefits of that. Um, the third one is um, movement. And we, we start everybody out just walking. Okay. Cause Harvard did a long-term study on walking just 21 minutes a day. You'll get massive health benefits. The fourth one is performance nutrition. We also keep that radically simple and we also base it off your genetic profile because Dr. Matt can tell you specifically what's going to be best for you based on your genetic profile rather than, you know, there's a, just a blanket diet that basically you don't right. know who it's working for. Everyone is specific. They have different right. genetics. They have different biomes, all that stuff. That's correct. And yeah. what we're really trying to do is get you to stop doing dumb things and do smart things and keep it simple. All right. And then the fifth one um, is laughingly simple. It's hydration. So, you know, that one's less work. It's just, you know, and we have a habit tracker app that will help people, you know, track this stuff. And then, um, um, and then, and then another one is called time restricted eating. It's different from intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. um, there's a doctor uh, Panda. You should have him on your show sometime from hmm. Salk Institute. Um, He's got a tremendous research on this subject. I've been doing time restricted eating for the last eight weeks, and yeah, I tell me about it. cured a twenty-year acid reflux problem. Doing wow, it. I've been doing. Um, I don't know if you'd consider intermittent fasting or so for a year. Um, so I'm curious of what the. I'm going to have you talk about the research. I only eat within like a three to four hour period every day, so maybe that's bad. But I eat from like three thirty to eight. Yep. That's every day. That's, that's all the time period I eat in. You know, I, I can't comment. I'm not a physician. Yeah. What, what the, the, I like time restricted eating. Yeah. Tell me about that. What's eat, why, why I like it is with intermittent fasting, there's multiple plans. So that automatically adds complexity for our client. Time restricted eating is simply try to eat in about a baseline 12 hour window, but what we really suggest is a nine to 10 hour window every day. Mm -hmm. And so that means stopping eating by a certain time. Yeah. So it's like, totally doable, by the way. Like easy. eating in a 10 hour, even eating in an eight hour period is totally doable. Right. So, like mine is, I, we're done at 5 30 p.m. And then I do not get any caloric intake until at least 7 30 a.m. And so I do bulletproof coffee. I'm a Dave Asprey fan. Yep. And I do that. And I don't do it one minute before because coffee is your first calories. And the reason is, is when you want to optimize sleep and health, you have to optimize your circadian rhythm and your digestive rhythm. Mm. Your, your digestive system has a clock, just like your brain. Mm. So the funny thing is, that's why, Steve, I feel like, how do you do that? Well, one, I don't drink coffee. So I don't it's probably easier for me because I yeah. can wait until three thirty. Like I don't drink coffee in the morning. So I just, I don't yeah. need to do that. Um, is there any benefit to shortening that or not? I guess. So like you have 12 hours, 10 hours, eight hours, six hours. I do four hours, three to four hours. Is there any benefits to that? Have you seen the research? The research I've seen, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the research <coughs> I've seen, is that at 10 hours, 11 and 10 hours, when they take people who aren't healthy, it seems to really start to have huge benefits. Because remember, most of the culture is eating for 15 hours a day. Okay, they'll start at six or seven in the morning and they're eating a snack at nine or 10 at night. And what's happening is, is the, re the restorative repair mechanisms are not happening the way they should. Yeah. So that ends up leading to um, metabolic syndrome. 
So, so do you know if it, is it better to do shorter or not? Is From there a what I've seen, yeah. yes, but I, I'm hesitant on this show to say. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, I won't hold you to it. I just didn't know if there's any research out there saying if you get to, like, if you shorten that, or is there, is it like, oh, no, like the sweet spot's like six? Because obviously I, I'm asking for selfish reasons because I just do three or four. I'm like, I, I think I read somewhere. I mean, I've done a lot of research that this this caloric restriction and, you know, like you were saying, time restricted eating is really super beneficial. There's a lot of research that shows that to what extent, um, like you have a biohacking category. I wouldn't say I'm a biohacker, but I definitely am an early adopter with health related things. And I will just test the limits of that in a sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, let's say I could do, okay, they say time restricted eating is good. Well, let me just do two hours. They're saying do 12. Like what happens when I do two hours? Yeah, you're a typical type A, you know, <laughs> you know, do, do a five-fold over what see, so, you know, what I have seen in the research is less is better. I haven't seen how far you can play that out. Okay. So yeah. I'd be happy to find out. I'm curious. Find out for yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, people are like, I can't even do 10 hours. Like, who cares about four? But but um, it, when, you're, when you're talking to elite athletes, performers, biohackers, they're one the edge. Like for them, if they go, if you said you eat within one hour a day every day, they do it. I know. I, I agree. But I, uh, we get a lot of people who they want that kind of performance, but it's a bridge too far to ask them to go from yeah. 15 hours a day to go six hour win. Totally, totally. But if you're talking like, let's say the coach, Penn State coach is like, hey, we've seen this proven, you know, proven performance, do what you want to do. The research is showing three hours would like right. peak you out. Good luck. The people who want to make the MBA be like, okay, here we go. I'm eating three hours in three hour window. Right. Well, you know what, what the core mechanism that's happening is, is you're giving your system a break so that it can restore. And the second thing is called autophagy, which is cellular garbage cleaning effectively. And yeah. that happens after about seven, eight hours. And so you're just going longer with that period. But, you know, the people that are doing 11 and 10 are getting tremendous benefits because the, the, they were getting no autophagy before, or very little of it. And now yeah. they're getting more. Yeah. So what was the seventh? So we have HRV, mindfulness, movement, performance, nutrition, hydration, time-restricted eating. Supplement nutrition. So Dr. Matt, based on his uh, medical background and your profile, will do targeted supplementation versus just guessing and a lot of it not helping you. So I'll give you an example. My son is a performance concierge in our company. He's had trouble with focus. Neurofeedback eliminated about 80% of the problem of his ADD. We put him through this program, found out he a couple things. His telomeres were extraordinarily long. That's good. But he had an immuno response deficiency that he found. And he also found two neurotransmitter deficiencies. So supplementation and eating has corrected the immuno response as well as his hmm. neurotransmitters. And now he is like a, he's just like a, an elite performer now. So what kind of supplements do you take? What do you take? I take a lot. Um, so uh, I'm in my mid fifties, so I have to take certain things for prostate health. So that, that's like a, a third of them because it's a cocktail. Um, but uh, I, I take fish oil. Um, I don't take a multivitamin. I take a fish oil. Um, I do uh, elderberry. Um, I'm just trying to think I'm sitting here. What's going, in your, what's in your water bottle? Is there like a supplements in your water bottle? I saw you were drinking or no. Okay. No, that, Oh yeah. This is a uh, pro uh, prebiotic. Got it. Drink. And, um, but I eat really clean, you know, my, because of my reflux, Dr. Matt had me go on dairy free, gluten free. And my wife has put together an amazing eating program for me and cooks for me. And, uh, so I eat really clean. So I don't have to supplement as much as someone who mm -hmm. does. Yeah. yeah. It depends what your diet looks like also depend on what you're supplementing with. Right. But you know, I went from a burned out guy two years ago. I'm running, I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost up to running half marathons now. Wow. So let's talk about how you, why you got into this, right? Take me back, take me to the place where your burned out entrepreneur hit a wall. What did life look like at that point? So we, you know, we, I left banking. I was a corporate banker until I was in my early 30s. 
um, had a very successful career, was a top salesperson there, generating a lot of loan volume. And, but I, I just, I, you know, the old saying in our bank was train the best, keep the rest. And um, so I wanted to leave and start my own company. I did. So I, I signed up for a franchise because I didn't have a, my own idea. And I had a vision right away. I wanted to grow to 100 million. And when I was in, in 1996, and we hit that number eventually. Wow. Um, the problem was, though, was uh, we, you know, in retrospect, I didn't have the kind of market like a Chicago land where I could do all of those stores. So we ended up having almost 50. And so we were in Dallas, Fort Worth area. We were in Alabama. We were in Tennessee, Virginia, Wisconsin, up in the uh, Fox Valley area, um, as well as Michigan. And so I had to travel extensively for a decade, uh, 100 nights a year. And I didn't know how to manage my stress. I didn't know anything that we're talking about today, like four years ago. And, um, and, and, but I had bought into the psychology of performance. I didn't understand anything about the physiology of performance. And so I ran myself into the ground until the point where the last year or so, um, I lost my passion. I was irritable. Um, my partners didn't like me very much. Um, I started making bad decisions and poor judgment. And um, if you ever, if you want to know where you are, there's a thing called the Maslach uh, survey. Um, and I can get you the link for your show notes or something later, uh, Jeremy. Or yeah, people can, can Google Maslach survey. Yeah, it's, it's the gold standard for burnout. And I had them all. Hmm. And so I just came to the conclusion that um, based on, you know, and it was also hurting my marriage at the time. I'll be I was going to say, that's what I just wrote down is like, how did, I mean, the family infrastructure is affected, but it's also, you know, can provide support, but it, that support starts to crack when you're on the road a hundred days a year. It does. And, and my kids by then were graduated from college on their own. So that was good. Um, and, you know, and I was around for a lot. It, it it didn't do long-term damage to my family, but you know, my wife, we're empty nest and my wife's home alone all the time. It wasn't good. And so I knew I needed to make a change. And so I did, and I sold to my partners. And um, in, the, in the middle of all of that though, um, I got referred to this neuropsychologist who had neurofeedback and I did his training. And then it just opened me up to all, a new world. And I found a passion again. And so when I sold, I took eight months off and all I did was read, read, read and study and talk to this guy. And then out of that started this company. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. And I, and I just don't want anybody else to go through this or at least help people back out of it if they are. There's two things I want to hit on. One, um, it's, it's amazing what you created with mm -hmm. hitting a hundred million dollars. I mean, that's, I don't know what the metric is for just hitting a million dollars for a company. It's probably less than 5% or 1% or something small. So that's amazing. What advice do you have for someone who really wants to grow their company to that level besides don't burn out? And, you know, obviously first you need to go to tigerneuro.com, make sure you have your health in place. <laughs> but what are some of the things that allowed you to grow um, maybe leadership wise or uh, systems wise or hiring wise, what, what advice do you have? So I, you know, multiple things that isn't an easy, simple answer, but what I'll say is you have to be a voracious reader and learner because if you're going to grow and adapt and adapt properly, you've got to have lots of input. So you got to read a lot. That's one thing. I, I read a hundred books a year since I was 19 years old, 20 years old and I'm 56 now. So you do the math. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, um, uh, you really have to dial in your, your, your core value proposition and know, because you can't scale on a weak value proposition. So mm. you really want to validate that and know it's good. And I had help there because we had a franchise that was validated. Uh, and so, uh, the next thing is, um, you know, I, I didn't do that alone. I had two brilliant partners uh, that were real estate guys. I, mm -hmm. My weakness was real estate. I knew operations and leadership and, and all of that and marketing. I didn't know real estate. So I partnered. So you, you, you're going to need to partner to do that. You're going to need to build investors, um, you know, because it, it, to, to replicate what we built would have taken, you know, $40 million. 
uh, of cash to get that to have the store asset base. Um, the other thing is, you know, learn leadership. You've got to understand leadership. Um, and you know, and I, I I developed a culture there with the team um, based off the principles of intrinsic motivation, meaning. Uh, everybody in the company had to have their own intrinsic motivators to be on the team. Uh, and that's what was going to give us the ability to deliver a Disney like experience in our stores. Mm. Um, I couldn't do that by fiat. I couldn't yell at people to do it. It had to come out of their own energy and mm. we were successful in doing that. Um, you have to, you have to know your numbers, uh, you know, and break down because uh, a business that gets that big, you've got to break it down into small pieces and isolate the economics of each piece and be able to understand that, how it contributes to the whole. And uh, that's probably enough. We'll talk about, uh, thank you for rallying off. That, that's, you know, it is a big question and topic. Um, what were some of, what are some of the leadership books that you have read that have been or, or books in general in business or leadership that you have been some of your favorites? Uh, the Leadership Challenge um, by Kuzis and Posner, mm -hmm. um, great book on leadership. Um, I really like uh, Good to Great. You know, it's getting dated now and older, but the concepts are still really good. You just got to ignore some of the companies. Um, yeah. The uh, and then um, I like John Maxwell's uh, leadership work because he takes a squishy, complicated subject and makes it simple. That's his gift of a communicator. And I, it doesn't matter that he comes out of the faith community. Um, the man knows leadership. And uh, I've used his material um, for going on 25 years now to train my leaders underneath me. Anything about intrinsic motivation? Yeah, um, well, there's a really good book by Daniel Pink who writes a layman's version of it um, called Drive. Yeah. Yep. But the really, the, the th there's three things you need to know out of that. One is you have to create purpose that everyone aligns with and buys into. The second thing is you have to create a path to mastery for each person in the organization so that they feel like they're growing. Um, and when you do that, that escalates uh, engagement. And then the last piece is you have to empower them. So think about it. If you, if they bought into your vision and you've trained them up, you got to let them go. And so that was the key for my company. I had store managers. We had converted them to coaches. They were basically life coaches and we had cashiers writing $5,000 orders. Um, we had anybody in the store could do anything. And we were getting parents, we, and we had everybody do their own core values and mission statements and goals. And we would do monthly, what we called uh, career builder interviews, where we would talk about how they're progressing. And so we would have parents of teenagers ask us, what are you doing with our kid? They're so much more focused. And so really what we did was we turned our company into a success training company, and mm -hmm. that led to great customer service, which led to growth. Yeah. All out of intrinsic motivation. That, I mean, I wrote that down in stars on my paper here. I think that's your next business book whenever you decide to write it. Um, the title could be Intrinsic Motivation. How mm -hmm. you go from zero to a hundred million dollar company. There's your subhead in your title, possibly. Um, I think in book titles, Steve, for some reason. Um, <laughs> that's really cool because that's really what almost seems like it's the core center of it because you can't do that alone. You need everyone to do help. And you also need everyone to have an intrinsic amount of motivation, like an outside core values. They need to have like this intrinsic motivation to actually do it. I agree. You can't motivate anyone consistently from the outside. They've got to do it themselves. And I'm also against the superstar CEO kind of thing. It, it doesn't really exist. It's great companies are built where everybody's bought in. Is there anything, you know, with that process, like you said, you had a sales training company is masked as like pet supplies or whatever. Success. What are success training? Yeah. Success training. Um, what are, what's another aspect of success training that someone in, in their own company be like, what else should they do? What else should they implement? Where should they start in that success training? Well, you know, uh, 
one area that this is self-serving to me, but I really mean this. Our yeah. first program is called Maximize, and it's not on the website yet because we're going to It is on the website. It's on step three. Max, well, well, it says flow state training. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, so what that's about is, is, you know, and we have it step three because you need to have the other stuff out of the way first to be able to, to do it consistently. But the concept is you can engineer – flow into your life. You, it's trainable. It's highly researched. And there are triggers, things like autonomy and the challenge, uh, the challenge skill balance, uh, risk, different areas you can. So I'm going to bring it back to your question is a company of a, a leader of a company who wants to create a culture that wins can engineer this stuff into their company, not only their own lives, but they can engineer it into how they structure how people work. So one of the examples is the, I have three people that work for me. We're a small company right now, but all three of them have total autonomy in their schedule. I said, you can get up when you want, you can go to bed when you want, you can work when you want, you can go, I encourage them to take an hour a day and go do something they really love outside of work uh, because there's pattern recognition and recovery built into that. Um, that's autonomy. So I've built autonomy into our company. It's like Patagonia does that. There are people, anytime they want to go surfing, they can. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, do you, are you allowed to share the working title of your new book or is yeah. that still in progress? Yeah, unless the, uh, we're pitching it to publishers uh, in June, they might change it. But yeah. my goal right now, it's decoding human performance, mm -hmm. the science of reaching your potential. So right now is de de decoding human performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So reaching your potential. Cool. I'm probably most flexible on the subhead. I, the, uh, I really am kind of committed to that title because that's what we're trying to do for people is take a complex subject, decode it for them and make it simple in a way that they can take action on. What's the, um, what's the subhead again? The science of reaching your potential. Okay. The, the thought behind that is, is, is that integration of physiology and psychology? Yeah, I have a pitch for a title for you. Okay. But, um, I'll go. So I, when I wrote what I wrote down, Steve is, and what people want, what top performers want, what I want, is to get in the zone. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wrote that down because that's what you help people do. We do. Yep. You help people get in the zone, or, or I, some version of that, right? I don't know. Yep. Um, so that's my pitch for, uh, the title, something in that effect is the end result, get in the zone. Um, that's what I want. Like if I read that title, what's that? Maybe in the subheader too. Yeah. Right? But if I read that, like, how do you get in the, the science behind getting in the zone? I'm like, okay, like sign me up, you know, okay. anyways, that's my pitch for you on that. Um, Last question I always ask, Steve. First of all, thank you. Everyone should check out tigerneuro.com. That's tiger, like a tiger, and then N-E-U-R-O.com. Check it out. Um, there's a self-discovery quiz there, um, which everyone should take. And just, just browse around, right? Um, not just for your health. What's up? All I would ask is if you're interested, you know, hit the free consult button. Um, we, we do an educational call. We don't hard sell anybody and myself or one of my performance coaches will talk to you and explain it in more detail. Totally. Yeah. I mean, for your sake, for your company's sake, but probably from your balance of your, your family life's sake also, um, there's two questions I always ask Steve since inspired insider. I always ask what's been a low moment and how'd you push through? And then what's been a proud moment on the other end? Mm. Um, on that journey, what's been a really challenging moment, time that you could think of, and then how you kind of pushed through it? I resonated with that early story you talked about about a guy coming home and saying no extras. Um, I have a similar story. You know, I left banking was a you know thirty one year old kid that had a couple hundred million dollar lending division reporting to him, and six months later. Uh, you know, we're losing money and have no income. And I come home and my daughter is, comes up to me when I walked up to the bedroom at night after I'd worked too long. 
you know, she's only like three and she gives me a hug and, you know, asked me where I was and why I was gone so long. And I held her and kind of got her to fall back asleep. And I remember just thinking, what have I done? I, you know, I'm sitting here broke. I can't even take my kids to the McDonald's and I'm working my full tail off. And just six months ago, I had the world by the tail. And, and, um, but you know, I, you know, we're all like that in weak moments. Um, but I, you know, I had a core, you know, my, I had a why I wanted to have an unconventional approach to time. I wanted to do things with my kids and my family that I couldn't have done if I was going to rise up in a big fortune 500 bank. And, uh, and, and, and so that was a low point. Um, yeah. probably. A so high- was it, was it that core value of you wanting something more? That's what kind of pushed you through that moment of, cause it's like heartbreaking, yeah. you know, when your child is like, where were you? Been? They, they just shoot straight. They're like, where have you been? You've been working too much. I don't yep. see you anymore. Yep. That type of thing. They cut right to it. Yeah. And, and so, yes, that's, that, that's what got me through it. Cause I knew, you know, I, I just needed another year or so and it was going to be fine. And it did, it proved out that it was, but um, that it was a low moment because it was the convergence of, of comparing what I had, where I was now being exhausted and having this precious little girl who's now 26, you know, 27 years old, you know, there with me. Um, so that, that was probably, that was a low point. I have more, but that was one. Of them. <laughs> I don't want to make this into a, like a, I don't want to make you cry on the interview. No. So I won't make you go through all of them, no. but it is. Yeah. Hi. I, yeah. A, that's the opposite of that, but it's related to the same idea was uh, my son was a, a baseball player. He ended up playing in college as a pitcher, a co- nice. collegiate pitcher, left-handed pitcher. And when he was seven years old, he loved baseball. We went down to a Detroit Tigers, Chicago White Sox game. We're Tigers fans. And, I'm a Cubs uh, fan, so no, no worries about that. No yeah. Problem. yeah. And that little stinker, I was 35, 36 at the time, and I had never gotten a ball my whole life. His first game, the outfielder for the Tigers flipped the ball up to him in between innings. And he just thought, like, this is what happens, you know, at the game. <laughs> That's normal. Right? Yeah. So we were leaving. And I remember a Sports Illustrated story where it talked about a father and son going to all the parks in the one summer. And I said to Colin at the time, I said, hey, buddy, what if we went to all the Major League Baseball parks as a family before you go to college? And he's like, let's do it. So mm-hmm. we were able to do that. We wow. knew all 30, 30 or 32 parks. And so the high point for me was, uh, the All-Star Game in 2013, um, one of my vendors paid for two high-end tickets for the whole week for me and my son to go because they'd heard about our story. We'd finished just earlier that summer in San Francisco. It was our last park. Wow. And so we were able to go. And um, it was, you know, that one kind of is a tearjerker for me because I think I can go right back to being in New York City and, mm. and the stadium and thinking about walking out of there for the last time and realizing we had done it. And it all tied back to why I got out of banking in the first place. Yeah. You could have that flexibility to just go into all these stadiums. Right. Yeah. I love it. And our family all went, our, the girls went to about half the games. Um, they what, went what were your top two favorite stadiums? So the all-star game is probably the culmination of everything. Yep. What were your top two favorite stadiums? Pittsburgh Pirates. Cause it's mm-hmm. a unique place with a unique view. Um, at night, and then I'll then um, obviously Wrigley, but uh, it was between Wrigley and Fenway Park. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the number one question we're asked. Oh, what are your favorites? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's probably another book that needs to be written too. Just our journey. Was- <laughs> well, that could also be actually part of um, intrinsic motivation, and the subtitle is how you go from whatever you know, not going home, you know, having your son or daughter say, you know, where have you been to stadium, going to stadiums around the world or whatever, <laughs> stadiums across the uh, country. You really but, do think that way. But Steve, thank you so much for, I totally appreciate your time, your expertise, sharing your knowledge. People can check out tigerneuro.com and um, just thank you again. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm very grateful for being a guest. What i got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side